Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Second Act, Life at 50 Plus. I'm Ron Beacom, here at the East Side Soup Kitchen in Saginaw. In today's program, we'll put the spotlight on a volunteer here at the Soup Kitchen. We'll find out what's involved in the new toll system and the bridges in Bay City. We'll find out why it's still important for a community to have a newspaper. And we'll keep moving with Chuck Cusick. This is Craig Barnes. He's the editor and publisher of the Pinconning Journal. The Pinconning Journal is a small weekly newspaper in Pinconning, Michigan, Northern Bay County. Uh, published the journal and its predecessors uh, continuously since 1892. We are the only remaining weekly newspaper in Bay County. This is Dave Clark. He's the editor of the Midland Daily News, which is owned by the Hearst Corporation. They cover the news in the Great Lakes Bay region, specifically Midland County. In May 2023, we are going to celebrate 165 years of newspapers in Midland County, which is a huge achievement. We've been telling the stories of people here for longer than most businesses have been around, including Dow Chemical, which is only 125 years old. Our job is primarily the same as it was when we started 165 years ago. We tell people stories. We still uh, deliver news on printed newspapers that are delivered to homes every day, but our primary delivery source now is digital. We have over 7 million page views on OurMidland.com every year. Both the continued presence of the journal and the daily news in their communities runs counter to a troubling trend. A study by Northwestern University shows on average that two newspapers per week in the United States are ceasing publication. Since 2005, 25% of the country's newspapers have been lost, primarily because of declining revenues in circulation. That's a concern for community leaders. Mike Hayes has lived in Midland for 50 years, working in the public and private sector. He's a former state representative and executive at Dow. I don't know how a community kind of um, stitches together the patchwork of, of parts of the community without a community newspaper. Um, it, it plays a role of keeping us all at least on some level of, same level of knowledge about what's going on, uh, what's going on with people, what's going on with institutions, what's going on with our governments. Um, it helps us to know which, uh, to keep track of what's, uh, what's happening in each other's lives. Um, and it helps older people understand that there's a whole lot of young people doing some really cool things and it helps young people understand that older people are doing really cool things. And so to me, it's just, uh, it keeps that fabric sewn together of a community. These are images from a high school boys basketball game in Pinconning on senior night in early March. The fans were there to support the Spartans and all the seniors who played on Pinconning's winter sports team. Craig Bart was there too, taking pictures of the seniors and the game action for the Pinconning paper. Bart acquired the journal six years ago after a career working as a mechanic and fleet manager. My aunt and uncle, Marcia and Tom Johnson, owned the newspaper and published it for almost 40 years. Uh, Tom was 83 years old when he passed away and still actively uh, publishing a paper every week. They have four daughters that are all out of, out of the area and I was uh, available so I purchased it from my aunt and became a newspaper publisher. The journal's primary revenue streams are commercial advertising, subscriptions, and public and legal notices. These are required by law by the state of Michigan to be published in the county in which the action is taken. I publish notices for Bay Metro Transportation for the different county road commissions and stuff like that. 
In addition to that, we publish for other legal notices if you're doing anything that goes to the probate court. So a name change, an adoption, uh, stuff like that, those have to be published in the county. The Michigan Press Association is challenging efforts to end the requirement to publish these notices in newspapers, instead moving them to websites. Yeah, that looks good. The church dog. What's the rest of it look like? Bart and his two part-time staff members publish every Wednesday. They do the layout in the building the paper has occupied for almost 100 years. But the newspaper itself is printed in big wrappers. The Midland Daily News is also printed there six days a week. 1,700 Pinconning journals come off the press. About two-thirds are mailed to subscribers. The rest are for sale in many locations in the area. The journal also has online subscribers. The website saw over 217,000 hits last month. The Midland Daily News recently saw the number of online subscribers surpass the number of print subscribers. But newspapers still have an audience who prefers the printed edition. People of a certain age, let's say, uh, like the, the feel of a newspaper. They want to get their news in a way that they're, they're used to. And that includes holding a newspaper in their hand and turning the pages. Um, and that gives us, you know, that gives us the basis of our subscribers. When you're flipping through the newspaper looking at the sports pictures, you can also see, hey, my township's going to pass a new ordinance and I may not like that. You don't have that with things on the internet. Besides featuring local events and activities, the journal is also the community's watchdog. Bart covers the meetings of the Pinconning City Council and the school board. Andy Kowalczyk is in his first year as the school superintendent. He's a Pinconning High graduate and has worked as a teacher and administrator for 25 years. He values the school's relationship with the journal. It's so amazing to have a, a small town newspaper with us. Um, he's at all of the board meetings, he's at our, our games. And it's something that our students and parents look forward to, you know, every Wednesday looking in the Pink County Journal and, and seeing whose pictures in there, what's going on, notes and information about the school. Um, it's great to be able to have that person where uh, if I need something to get out to the public, yeah, I can do the phone call home uh, to our parents, but there's more that, that need to hear what we have to say here at the school. and. Uh, that relationship is great to be able to get that in the newspaper and, and have it out to our public. The journal, like newspapers everywhere, captures the community's history. This is our archive. These are physical copies of the newspaper. Um, it, well, we, we live by the week in the newspaper world. So this is week one, week two, week three. And then within these weeks, our, we go back by years. So we're back to about 2009 here. So we've got close to 15 years of papers here. As we get older, we have them bundled up by the year. And then older still, we have papers in books. So this happens to be 1961. So there's the first paper of 1961. We are actually working on a project with the Bay County Library System that they are digitizing all of our old newspapers. The newspapers have been kept on microfish, microfilm, uh, microfilmed by Clark Historical in, at CMU. They are now digitizing that and making it freely available on the internet. Dan, how's the Dow story going? Yeah, well, I just left a message with Kyle. Um... Dave Clark's history in journalism goes back to the mid-1990s and yeah, includes I mean, a stop in Bad Axe at the Huron Tribune. That helps. He returned to his hometown paper a year ago. Why journalism? I believe that journalism is public service. I believe that journalism can help communities become the best versions of themselves by helping them explore the issues that are important to them and solve the problems that are happening in those communities. 
I believe that journalism is required in communities, that every good, healthy community has some sort of watchdog news organization to make sure that when deals are made and decisions are made, that they're made fairly and equitably. Clark's interest in journalism started when he worked on the school newspaper at Midland High. He came back to Midland after working in higher education at Central Michigan University, mentoring students. This is what he looks for in young journalists. They care about people. They care about the community that they're a part of. They're interested in communities that they're not a part of. And they want to have a role in being able to help those people have a voice. It's really important for newspapers to continue to be able to tell the stories of people who otherwise wouldn't be heard. Uh, that's why students still want to major in journalism. Uh, that's why um, graduates and other folks uh, looking for maybe second careers, their second act, uh, look at journalism because they want to be part of that community conversation. There are nine people on Dave Clark's editorial staff in Midland, plus several freelance reporters. I serve as one of those freelancers. Although the newspaper staff has shrunk considerably over the years, with the business model facing several challenges, Clark is optimistic about the industry's future. Although I think our obituary has been written many times over, um, is bright. We're consuming more news today than ever before in the history of the world. So we're producing a product that people want. And I think if we learned anything through the pandemic, it is that we really as a society have to have a reliable source of unbiased information available to us every day. Not just to, to navigate the worst of times, but also at the best of times too. Up next, an issue that's getting a lot of coverage in the media, the new toll system for two of the bridges in Bay City. Hi, I'm Lynn Pavlock. I'm the general manager with Bay City Bridge Partners here in downtown Bay City. We are the local subsidiary for United Bridge Partners, and United Bridge Partners is headquartered in Denver, Colorado, and they really invest in infrastructure solutions to communities nationwide. So Bay City Bridge Partners, we are leasing the Liberty Bridge and Independence Bridge from the city. We are fully funding the design, the demolition, the uh, construction work to rehabilitate and modernize those two bridges. So you probably see in the background is Liberty Bridge. That is one of our bridges that we're leasing. The other that we're leasing is Independence Bridge, so that's a little further to the north. Um, and then there's two bridges to the south. There's the Veterans Bridge, which is by Vets Park, by the Ball Diamonds, the Community Center, and then there is Lafayette Bridge. Um, those two bridges are owned by the state, or those are considered MDOT bridges. So, you know, the Liberty and Independence Bridge will be toll bridges. And let's just think about what the alternative is or was for the city. They would have shut down one or possibly both of those bridges. And if you can imagine, you know, having a town that's used to having four bridges, now going down to two bridges, that would have been created a lot of frustration and traffic congestion for the community. So the city really looked for innovative solutions in terms of how could they still um, bring in some private company to rehabilitate the bridge as well as continue to maintain the bridge. A bascule bridge, which is what the four bridges in Bay City are, are 10 times more expensive to operate and maintain than a stationary bridge. And quite frankly, the city just didn't have the resources to do that. They did um, look to the county for assistance. They looked to state level and regional levels, federal levels, to try to see if there were some ways that they could get additional funding, and it, they just were unsuccessful. Again, Bay City Bridge Partners is fully funding that. And with that, um, no tax dollars are being spent. But the way we recover our investment is through tolls. Tolls recover the uh, upfront investment, which we're putting over $160 million into the two projects here. And then they, they fund the ongoing operations and maintenance of both of those bridges. So how does the community get ready for tolling? 
If you are a resident of the city of Bay City, you need a BC Pass in order to qualify for the resident discount, which means you'll be free until 2028. If you are not a city resident, but you are a frequent user of either of the bridges, uh, you will need to get a BC Pass in order to take advantage of the $15 per month subscription rate. Um, again, if you don't have a BC Pass, you will be charged the pay-by-plate rate. You can come visit us at our Customer Service Center. Again, we're located at 300 Center Avenue, Suite 101. Walk in, we have our customer service reps. They will assist you in creating your account, bring a valid photo ID, valid vehicle registrations, if you're registering more than one, as well as some form of payment, a debit or credit card. And they will help you get your account created. That's the first way. The second way is you can do it online, utilizing our self-service uh, customer website for account creation. You can go to baycitybridgepartners.com and there will be a link on there, click that and it'll walk you through the steps on how to create your account online. If you do it online, we will mail you a transponder. If you do it in the office, you will walk out with your transponder in hand. We are targeting to start tolling on May 1st. So I encourage everyone to sign up for a transponder. It ensures you will pay the uh, lowest toll rates for your particular vehicle class. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. You can uh, check out our social media websites, our Facebook page, or stop in or contact our office. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. We next put the spotlight on a woman who volunteers here at the East Side Soup Kitchen helping prepare and serve the meals. The kitchen in the East Side Soup Kitchen on Genesee Street in Saginaw was a beehive of activity on a recent Friday morning. Patty Turner is one of several volunteers who helps the three-person kitchen staff prepare <laughs> lunch. She's been a regular volunteer for eight years. Patty's a retired registered nurse. She last worked in the Covenant Hospice at the Cartwright Center in Saginaw. So a few years before I retired, I was able to go part-time. And at that time, I came here when it had came to this facility and asked if they needed volunteers. And they said, of course. So I started volunteering then about one day a week. And my husband retired a year before I did, and he was getting restless. So I said, well, why don't you come down and see what it's about, see if you'd like it. So he came down, and he loved it. So it started being something we could do together one day a week. Not too long after that, my sister, who's now in her 80s, said, you know, I'm kind of interested. Can I go down with you someday and see? So she came down, and now the three of us work together. So it's a real family affair on Fridays. We're all here together most Fridays. Patty, her husband Bill, and sister Betty Dork report at 8.30 a.m. and are assigned their duties for the day. Well, when you come in, you find out what the recipes are gonna be for the day, and the main cook will give you assignments. And like today, we're making salsa, so we started out cutting up gobs of tomatoes and onion for guacamole. We're going to put those things in the guacamole today. So every time you come in, it's a different menu. You have different jobs assigned to you. And when you get done with that job, they give you a new job. And so you never know what you're going to do when you get here. But if it's something you don't know how to do, they show you how to do it so you learn new skills too. So every day is a new day. The East Side Soup Kitchen first started serving meals in 1980 in a local church. They've been in their current location for 17 years. Up to 600 meals are prepared each day, Monday through Friday, for both dine-in and takeout, including the drive-through in the parking lot. Good morning, everybody. How's it all today? Their mission is to provide meals and hope in the heart of Saginaw. In addition to volunteering in the kitchen, Patty serves on the board of directors. You watch the news and you learn about all the famine and food shortage in the world, and it seems overwhelming. And sometimes we forget that right here in the United States, here in Michigan, and certainly here in Saginaw County, we have hungry people. There's a food desert right here where we're standing. 
And so this provides not only a warm meal every day of the week, Monday through Friday, a nice home-cooked hot meal, but the folks that come into the dining room, it's a community. They know each other and they check on each other. If somebody's sitting at a table with a group of their friends and they say, hey, where's Joe? Have you seen Joe today? No, was he here yesterday? No, I don't remember seeing him. Well, then let's stop and check on them on our way home. So it is not just a place to feed their belly, but it's a community. And I think that's important. Patty also volunteers at the VNA and for Covenant Harrison as a baby cuddler. She encourages retirees to get out and get involved. I would suggest that maybe they stop and think about what are their passions? What are they interested in or curious about? And like here at the soup kitchen, we have hundreds of volunteers and we could not do this job without them. It takes all of us together, but I get so much good out of it. I mean, you meet such amazing people when you volunteer, no matter where that is. But here I get to work with people of all different ages, from high school kids, college kids, folks that are here through the court system for community service, other seniors like myself, and we come from all different walks of life. And then you've got our guests who are just amazing. So it's a very enriching experience for me personally, and as I said, for my entire family. And all the nonprofits are like that. They all need help. And so the skills that you had earlier in your life can be applied so many different ways, be it nonprofit, be, be it your hospital systems or school systems. There's something out there for everybody, and it's scary to take that first step. It is, but I'm telling you, it will enrich your life so much just to get out there and see how many good people are doing good things. Thanks, Patty. To learn how you can volunteer at the Eastside Soup Kitchen, just go to their website or give them a call. Up next, we'll keep moving with our volunteer, Chuck Cusack. As we begin today, let's think about what we've done in the last 24 hours. How much of that time did we just sit? Was it in the car? Was it on the couch? Was that our desk and work? Whatever it is, it could have been an awful lot of hours. We all know that we should exercise at least 30 minutes every day. But is 30 minutes enough? I'm saying it's not. We can be active couch potatoes, working our 30 minutes a day and just lazing around or sitting the rest of the time. Today I'd like to suggest that whatever we're doing, sitting, on the couch, at our desk, every half hour or 45 minutes, let's get up and do something. And I'm gonna give you some suggestions on different things we can do. Well, it's time to get out of the chair. Let's start just by doing a couple of squats Easy to do, great for our legs, good for our balance, and get that blood moving. And once we're up, we can open up with a stretch. We can cross one arm across, stretch our shoulder. Stretch the other shoulder. Walk around the chair, walk around the desk. Do that for about a minute and then go back for your next 45 minutes of sitting at your desk or at the TV. Well, let's keep the exercise going. Again, I love to do the squats, they are so important. But this time, let's do a little bit of balance work. Can you stand on one leg? Your doctor will be so proud of you. This is exercise too because I've got to engage a lot of muscles to do it. I'll switch legs. See, now that isn't hard, is it? The important thing is, got up out of the chair and worked on doing something. Maybe I'll do another stretch. I'll put my hands behind my back and stretch them out. Feels good too. One last stretch. Put my hands behind my ears and open up. 
my arms, pushing them straight back. So many exercises that we can do, and we should do, every 30 to 45 minutes. This time we're up, now we're going to stretch our legs. Might as well, we're going to need to use them throughout the day anyway. An easy way to do it is kind of a modified lunge. I might hold on to the chair to make sure I'm steady. Not necessarily have to do it, but you feel, might feel a lot better doing it that way. I'll go down, stretch. I feel this in my quadriceps, back in my hamstrings, and up. And I can do both legs. And that can make another good way to work on our exercises and muscles throughout our body. Another good exercise we can do is work our shoulders. A good way to do that is with pushaways. Just go up against the wall, hand shoulder width or a little more apart, straighten our back, and lean forward and push back. You know, you can do this off your desk too, or even on the floor. I do at least 10 to make sure I got a little bit of work on my muscles. Now you've seen there's several things we can do, and you can come up with a lot more with weights or what have you. But what are you doing for your 30 minutes of exercise? Let's not neglect that. Why not a good walk? We're going into springtime. What a great time to get outside, hear the birds, strut out, strut out and really enjoy the springtime. And whatever, don't ever stop moving. As always, thanks Chuck. Thanks as well to our media colleagues at the Pinconning Journal and the Midland Daily News, Lynn at Bay City Bridge Partners, and Patty here at the East Side Soup Kitchen. You can see this edition of Second Act and others on our website. My name is Ron Beacom. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again in June. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.